A few years ago, I came to something of a sort of unfortunate realization. I was not great at cleaning. Now, don't get it twisted, I didn't live like a pig or anything. I changed my sheets regularly, didn't leave dishes around, and generally kept my apartment clean and tidy. But then as I learned, if you live in an apartment in the northeast and try to skimp on heating bills in the winter, you're going to invite in some very unwanted guests into your apartment. I'm not talking about rats or roaches, I'm talking about mold. Now don't worry, this isn't going to be some story about me taking on a mold outbreak or anything, although it was scary how much it spread and how gross it was to clean. No, this story is about how we all think we know the places we live, right up until we realize that we don't. So without boring you with all of the pointless details, there was this huge mold outbreak and it took a whole day's worth of dabbing Clorox on the walls to get rid of it all. Like a lot of stuff like that, it's no good to just bleach what you can see. You gotta find the source. So in every room in my apartment, which was four if you count the hallway, I had to bleach all the mold I could see and find the source, which was sometimes hidden somewhere out of sight. So I do the TV room and the kitchen and work my way down the hallway and into the bathroom and finally I start working on my bedroom. As I'm sort of dabbing away, I slowly figure out that the mold is coming from my boiler closet, which figured because damp, dark, warm place, of course it's going to grow there first. I don't think I'd open this closet in maybe a year, which I know, lucky me, right? Never having any hot water problems? Well, not so lucky actually, because I opened up that closet door and saw the mother load staring me right in the face. The whole outbreak must have come from this one huge patch that I had found growing in the closet, so I got to work wiping the whole place down. Once I thought I was done, I grabbed a flashlight, kind of leaned into the closet and started looking around for any patches that I'd missed. Up near the closet ceiling was this little wooden shelf and on that little shelf was something made of fur or felt or something, because it was natural enough for the mold to really take a liking to it. Knowing I'd have another outbreak if I just left it there, I grabbed what turned out to be a little felt-lined box and then carried it off into the kitchen to be cleaned. Obviously, I'm way curious to see what's inside, mostly because this thing had been sat in my apartment for coming up on like three years without me knowing it was there. It also dawned on me that whatever was inside, it was precious enough to store in some fancy fur box before hiding it away somewhere. Therefore, there was a good chance that there might be, I don't know, maybe some coins in there or maybe even some precious stones. So after wiping away some of the mold, grime, and dust that accumulated on what had to have been many years, I unclasped the little brass lock and opened up the box. Inside was nothing but a small envelope and an old audio cassette tape. The tape didn't have any labels on it, so there was no telling what it contained, and the same applied to the envelope. No name, no address, nothing. I didn't have any means of playing the tape. My laptop doesn't even have a disc tray anymore, so I opened up the envelope to find a bunch of photographs inside. The first two or three photos were just of some dirty old basement, so I started flipping through them much faster until I saw one of a girl. Not right away I knew something was off because she didn't seem to be posing in any of the pictures. It looked like whoever had taken them had just shoved a camera in her face, flashed and all and then just snapped away until she looked annoyed and then started to look scared. It was the scared expression that really caught my attention and I recall staring at that one photo for a little too long. Not so much because it was nice to look at, which it wasn't, but because I was dreading whatever came next. I started flipping through the photos some more, real fast before shoving them back into the envelope and closing it. What I saw didn't seem real. It looked like something out of some horror movie, but there was no way in hell that I was going to look at them all over again to check. I saw that basement again, with the girl in it, and this time, she was tied up, with no clothes on, and she looked... that look on her face... No actor or actress in the world can capture that true terror, but it was etched all over that poor girl's face. I had no idea what to do with myself at first, I just 
knew that I had to get them out of my apartment. I didn't want to touch them because I was panicking about having my fingerprints all over them, even though they looked like they were taken at a time when I wasn't even alive. I guess I was just so shocked by what I'd seen that I wasn't thinking straight, but I went full forensic files and didn't want to go anywhere near the envelope or tape for fear of contaminating evidence or something like that. I then called the cops, told them the whole story, and then I was told that I'd get a call from the relevant party either later that day or the following morning. They also told me not to worry about all that contamination stuff as they could just take a sample of my DNA and fingerprints to eliminate me as a suspect. Essentially, I didn't have to go treating that boiler room closet or kitchen like some crime scene. I could just put it all to one side, maybe even a grocery bag or whatever, and someone would be by to take a look. The next day, some detective guy stopped by my apartment after giving me a call ahead, and after putting on some of those plastic gloves, he started to take a look through the photographs. The thing that I still find incredibly creepy about those few moments was how he was able to look through each and every photograph, really take them all in, and he didn't even bat an eye. The few flashes of stuff that I'd seen had me shoving them back into the envelope and panicking from how messed up they were, but there was this middle-aged gray-haired cop just cold as ice as he's looking through some of the most messed up stuff I've ever seen in my life. It made me wonder what other stuff he'd seen in his time to make him so stone cold like that. Having determined the pictures were legitimate, the cop started bagging up the evidence and asked me if I'd listened to what was on the tape. When I told him no, he told me, probably for the best. Before he left, he asked me to take a look in my closet real quick, as in the place that I'd found the box in the first place. I told him sure. Then after making sure that there was nothing else hidden away, he gave me his contact details and told me to give him a call if I ended up finding anything else. I never did find anything else, nor did I ever hear back from the detective. Part of me wanted to reach out at one point just to see how the investigation was going, but I didn't because there was only one thing I really needed to know, and that was something I could find out for myself. I went down into the basement of my apartment building just to take a look around, and I don't think words can sum up how relieved I was when nothing matched any of the scenery that I saw in the photographs. I know that there was nothing I could have done about what happened to that poor girl in the photographs, but it helped me sleep a lot better knowing that it hadn't all happened beneath the place that I laid my head at night. This story took place in 2020 when I was 18 years old. I lived in a relatively safe neighborhood, but my country does have a high crime rate in general, so take that with a pinch of salt. My dad had passed away earlier in the year and I had no siblings, so my mom and I lived alone in our house. The lockdowns were still in place, but as certain restrictions were lifted, people were starting to return to work. Between my house and the train tracks was a stretch of empty field. It became a safe, quiet space for me to escape to wherever I needed to get out of the house. I would normally sit there once a day for a cigarette or two, sometimes for a little picnic. My home situation was complicated, to say the least, and due to the lockdowns, I really had nowhere else to go. On this particular day, I went there for a few minutes to smoke, as always. I was about halfway through my cigarette when I noticed a young man walking along the train tracks on the other side of the field. He was barefoot and wearing dirty, worn-out clothes. He noticed me and made a hand gesture suggesting that he was asking for a smoke. I should have just left, but as a teenager, I found it difficult to say no to people. I walked across the field and handed him a smoke, he took it from me and I immediately felt uneasy with the way he was looking at me. He asked me, Don't you live in that house over there? And pointed at my house. I avoided answering the question and at this point realized that I needed to leave. I had left from my front gate that day. For him to know where I lived, he must have watched me leave from the back gate before. I told him I needed to get going. He started insisting on giving me a hug to say thank you and I declined several times. At this point I turned around and started walking away quickly. I didn't get very far. 
He caught up to me and put his arm around my waist. I started to panic, not knowing what to do. All I could think of was that I needed to get away. As I tried to start running, he grabbed me from behind and started dragging me toward the row of houses where the view from the road is completely blocked. The fences were high too, so no one could see the field from their backyards, and we were completely isolated. I was kicking and struggling, desperate to get out of his grasp. He ended up throwing me on the ground, with him on top of me, still holding on. In a split second, my life flashed before my eyes. The feeling that something terrible was about to happen came over me. I couldn't escape. He was too strong. My arms were trapped by his and he was holding me down so I couldn't kick him. I did the only thing I had left to do and I started screaming for help. Suddenly I was free. I could move. He had let go and jumped off of me. He ran away. My heart was still pounding. I was shaking and shocked from what had just happened. He disappeared into the industrial area on the other side of the train tracks. I immediately ran towards the road. As I reached it, I noticed it was empty. There were no cars parked in my neighbor's driveways. No one heard me screaming, and had he realized, that day could have had a far worse ending. He knew where I lived, and I was terrified of him returning. For months, I had panic attacks and nightmares, and I could barely leave my house without breaking down. I moved away from there a year later, but I still sometimes get scared when I'm home alone or walking around town. I, a female, 36, wish this wasn't real. Let me start by saying it's crazy how children are so trusting. Maybe it's just me. When I was seven years old, my parents and I were living in a basement apartment in the Bronx. The way the apartment was set up had my mother and father's room at one end of the short hall, the bathroom in the middle, and my room at the other end. If you don't know anything about a basement apartment, just know that it doesn't take much effort to enter one through a window. One very early morning, possibly around 7 or 8, I was woken up by a very sharp, intense pain on my buttock. I got up, thinking our cat had gone into my room and had bitten me, as she used to nip hard and attack whatever she felt like, toes included. I jumped up, looking for her, only to see a grown man sitting on my bed. I remember being upset and asking him why he had pinched me, to which he hushed me and said something about being thirsty. I remember pulling down my nightgown to cover my buttock and asking him if he wanted juice or water. I wasn't scared at all, more surprised and mad that this man had pinched my buttock so hard. He said that he wanted juice, so I left my room and closed my door with him still sitting on my bed. I walked to the kitchen and got him some juice. As I was bringing the cup back to my room, I looked at my parents' door and thought that I should wake them up, but I can't remember why I decided against it. I ended up giving the man the cup and he drank the juice. I remember he asked me if I could help him find his friend and he told me that he was lost. I remember my dad told me that I wasn't allowed to go outside without him or my mother. They were worried as this was a new neighborhood and we had only moved in maybe two weeks earlier. I remember being scared to go outside because I didn't want my parents to be upset with me so I told him that I had to wake up my parents to ask. I remember he said that it would be real quick because he knew his friend was somewhere in the area and we would find him quickly. I once again said no and told him that I was not allowed to go outside without my parents, so he ended up saying that he didn't need my help anymore and that he would find them. He asked me to lock the door behind him, so I walked him out, locked the front door, waving goodbye. I tried to go back to sleep, but it was too late, I was wide awake. So I started watching cartoons. Well, the volume happened to be louder than expected because my mother woke up and asked me, very angrily, why I was awake so early. I told her all about the man pinching my butt, to which at first she didn't believe me as she thought that I had had a bad dream, but she lifted up my nightgown and I guess I must have had a bruise. I will never forget how she got so calm and started smiling at me with a very sweet voice asking me what he looked like, what happened, and if I remember what he was wearing. I told her and she left my room for a moment, coming back with my dad. 
She then told me to tell him everything using that same sweet voice, and I did. I didn't think that I was in trouble or anything, and I thought that I had made a new friend. After telling them about my new friend, they got dressed and started searching. Well, it didn't take long because he happened to be the superintendent's family member. When I saw him, I immediately shouted at him, Hey, friend! My parents told me to go inside, which I did. Maybe an hour or so later, my parents came back with McDonald's for me, but they seemed angry. Before the end of that day, my father put a padlock on my door and told me that whenever I go to sleep, I should always lock my door, as our kitchen windows didn't lock, and that's how we got in. Sometime later, when I was 15, I found out that the guy was mentally ill and was sent away from the Dominican Republic by his family so he wouldn't get arrested for something he did out there with another little girl. But that's it. It still surprises me that I wasn't scared in the moment. And please, if you or anyone you know lives in a basement, ground level apartment, or flat, please triple check that all the window locks work and lock your windows up. Back when I lived in the rural Midwest about 10 years ago, I lived in a house right off of the highway. My house was situated right between two towns, almost on the county line, and it had a large circular driveway. If you drove into the driveway, you would head straight toward our barn. If you turned right, you could access our garage. Continuing past the garage allowed you to circle around in front of the house and return to where you started. Our house featured two large double doors in the front, which were rarely used. Instead, we usually entered through the doors inside the garage. One night, it was very late and the doorbell rang. My husband, our three-year-old daughter, and I were all asleep. The sound woke me up, and at first I thought I might be dreaming. Then it rang again, and I woke my husband. He initially believed that I was hearing things, until it rang again. It was very dark outside, but we had a dust-to-dawn light that illuminated most of the driveway. Unfortunately, the front doors couldn't be seen unless you opened one of them and looked outside. You could open just one at a time or both simultaneously using two latches located at the top and bottom of one of the doors. My husband decided to open the door while I wanted to call the police. However, we knew it would take some time for them to arrive since we lived on the county line. He opened the door to find a young woman, perhaps in her early 20s. She appeared normal, except for the fact that she was standing at her door in the middle of the night. I looked beyond her and noticed her car parked in our driveway just off the road, not close to the house or the circular driveway. She claimed that she needed to use the phone, explaining that her car battery had died or something, but she wasn't sure. I told my husband that there was no way that we should let her in, as this was how horror movies often started. We offered to call the police, the county sheriff, but she kept insisting. We assured her that we would make the call, and she eventually walked away. As we watched her return to her car, which was approximately 50 feet away, my judgment of distance might not be too precise, I'm sorry, but I could see both her and the car clearly. I proceeded to call the police, and they said they'd arrive in about 15 minutes. At this point, neither my husband nor I were overly concerned. We assumed it was just a girl with a dead battery. However, as she opened her trunk, no lights illuminated and she began rummaging around inside. Then, the driver's side door opened and a man stepped out, followed by another man exiting the back passenger door. They continued to search the trunk with no lights on and I couldn't hear any of their conversations or determine their actions. They all eventually returned to the car. About five minutes had passed and I was silently praying that the sheriff would hurry and arrive, even though I knew that it would take another ten minutes or so. The three individuals remained in the car, lights off, motionless. I couldn't see them clearly inside the car, but I knew that they hadn't exited and walked past the house, as they would have had to have passed under the dust to dawn light, which would have been visible to me. I thought I saw the driver light a cigarette, but I wasn't entirely sure. Then... Something unexpected occurred. A man, whom I didn't recognize, emerged from the right side of the property, walking from the direction of the barn. We didn't have neighbors for at least a mile, and he appeared to be coming from the back of my property, which ended at a creek. 
He walked directly under the dust to dawn light and proceeded straight to the car without looking at the house. He got into the back of the car and the vehicle started up. They slowly backed out of my driveway and headed north. The police arrived approximately 10 minutes later and by that point I was in a state of panic. They conducted a search but couldn't find anything suspicious. They asked if we had noted a license plate number but the car had been parked too far away. They advised us to call if the individuals returned which didn't instill much confidence. My husband retrieved his shotgun from the workshop on our property and we attempted to go back to sleep. One late night at around 3 a.m., I was sitting at my home on my PC, watching movies, playing games, and so on, when I noticed that I was out of cigarettes. The only place that's open late at night is our local gas station, which isn't too far from my home, but it's still easier to go by car. I took my car keys, locked my house, and headed to the gas station. I live in a small European country known as the safest country on the planet. However, that doesn't mean that bad things don't happen here and there. When you exit the suburban area where I live, you need to turn right to reach the main road. From there, you just go straight for about half a kilometer and then turn left for another half a kilometer to reach the gas station. On the way, I noticed a girl on the sidewalk. I usually drive slower at night because many people tend to speed and run red lights during the nighttime. This girl was walking faster than usual, appearing panicked. I noticed two guys behind her who were about 10 feet away, maybe even less, and they were pointing at her and making hand gestures towards her. This gave me a really bad vibe, and as I got closer to the girl, I noticed that she had a frightened expression on her face, as if she was about to cry but held back the tears. So I pulled over close to her and asked very quietly, Are you in trouble? And she just looked at me and nodded her head in response. I told her to get in the car, and she did. I explained to her that I was on my way to the gas station to buy cigarettes, but that I would take her home as soon as I finished making the purchase. She thanked me profusely. I asked if she wanted to go to the police to report the incident, but she said she just wanted to go home. I went to the gas station and bought cigarettes for myself and a bottle of water for her. She was clearly in a state of fear, and afterward I took her home. We passed the same street where those two guys had followed her, but there were no signs of them. I'm just imagining if I hadn't run out of cigarettes that night, what would have happened to her? I'm a woman from China, but I grew up in Sydney, Australia. I was born in Beijing on the outskirts in a large town called Yunggang Residential District, where my mom's family is from. When I was five, my family and I immigrated to Australia, but we would still travel back to China every few years. This incident happened in the snowy winter of 1997 when I was 11 years old. My grandparents still lived in Yunggang and introduced me to a brother and sister who lived in the same building as them. I can't remember their exact ages, but I think the older girl was around 14 and the younger boy was around 6. I still remember the exact outfit that I was wearing because i have been wearing the same outfit throughout the trip. At that time, flared jeans were in fashion and coming from Australia, I wasn't prepared for the snow and cold of the Chinese winter. So on my first or second day there, my Chinese cousin had taken me to a shopping mall where she helped me haggle down the price of a bright pink duffel coat with fluffy white trimming. I thought it was the most fashionable thing ever and wore it every day. I have photos of me from the trip wearing that exact outfit. We walked around town and ended up going to a very large park with a lake inside of it. It was a little bit of a distance from the center of town. We were playing by the shore, throwing rocks, joking around, and having a good time. At some point, I looked up and realized that it was getting dusky. Although it probably wasn't very late, considering it was winter, the sun set early. The park, which had never been very busy to start with, was nearly deserted. There were still some people, but they were a fair distance away from us except for two men who suddenly approached us. They were middle to late middle-aged and the uncle type. 
One of them approached me and said that he was a friend of my father's and that he'd asked him to pick us up. I remember being confused because my dad didn't live in this town and was in another district about two hours away in Beijing, where his family was from, and pretty quickly, I realized something was off, and so did the brother and sister that I was with. We all started making excuses and backing off. I still remember very clearly that as we started backing away, the man who approached us looked over his shoulder at his companion as if asking him what he should do. His companion was standing a little distance away beside a white van with the door already slid open. I completely believed that he was considering snatching one of us and making a run for it. However, perhaps because there were three of us, and perhaps because there were still people around in the peripheries, they didn't do anything. As I walked away rapidly, I looked back over my shoulder and remember seeing the two men just standing there, watching us go. That 15 to 20 minute walk back was one of the scariest walks of my life as I imagined someone grabbing me from behind every second. The sun set just as we got into the building and I burst in through the door, so happy to be home safe. I did tell my mom and grandmother about it, but at that time, child kidnappings in China, while already happening, were much less of a massive and widespread news story than it is now. I think my mom especially felt that being almost kidnapped was somehow a commentary on her parenting skills and was very dismissive and even now dislikes it when I bring it up. Now that organized child and or bride kidnappings are such a huge story in China, it often makes me shiver at night to think how different my fate could have been. There have been so many stories about young women and girls kidnapped and forced into becoming brides of villagers in remote countrysides, sometimes tied to beds and having their legs broken to prevent them from running away. They're forced to bear children one after another. No one in the village will help them because almost all the men in the village have purchased brides from traffickers in this way. There are also children, usually boys, kidnapped into families who have been unable to have kids or adopt legally. They fare a bit better but can also be abused and neglected. Now that I have my own kids and am safe and warm in my bed in Sydney, I sometimes think about how wildly and irrevocably my life may have derailed that snowy evening. This happened last week and although she didn't seem malicious, the things she said were creepy. I, a 19 year old male, was heading home from university and to get there I had to take the train. When I boarded, many seats were already occupied. In my country, the seats are arranged in a way that allows four people to sit facing each other and they are quite close together, perfect for conversation even with strangers unfortunately. I noticed an available seat in front of a girl who appeared to be one or two years younger than me, but it's hard to be certain. I approached her and asked if I could sit there. Of course, she replied, looking at me in a strange and intense manner. To distract myself from her, I took out my phone and she also had a chocolate bar in her hand which would become important later. She asked me, where do you live? And I thought, why do you need to know? So when she inquired about my destination on the train, I told her the stop I would be getting off at. She informed me that she would be getting off at that next stop too. Then she started singing and said, Oh, sometimes I sing. I'm a silly girl. And repeated it. Every time she said something, she gazed at me as if expecting a response. To avoid further conversation, I simply replied, It's okay to be silly. Subsequently, she told me, you're pretty. And when I asked, what? She questioned whether she was pretty. In my language, the second question is an extension of the first, so it seemed like she was correcting herself. She also asked if she had chocolate on her face, and indeed, she did. She even offered me some chocolate, but I declined. She also mentioned a piercing that had come off, and she attempted to put it back on right there on the train. I suggested that she should just go fix it where she originally got it, and she asked, In Germany? Will you go there with me? However, I promptly declined. As she struggled to put back her piercing, a mouth piercing, she declared that she was in love with me. 
I told her that I had a girlfriend, even though I didn't, but there are many attractive girls at my university, and I said, uh, the pace is too fast for me. In response, she threatened to beat my girlfriend. Her I love you escalated into, I'll kidnap you, and strip for me. She asked if I would go with her and if she could accompany me home. Finally, when the train arrived at my destination, she asked, Are you leaving, my love? I replied in the affirmative and went on my way, thankfully, without her following me home. This story comes from Belgium and took place in 2020 during all the confinements that we were under. I was 20 back then. At the time, because of the severity of everything going on in Belgium, the law stated that you should only go out to practice sports or to work, so I took the habit of meeting with a friend, they go by solely, to go out for runs and to practice all kinds of sports in general. Both of us were quite fond of urban exploration and knew a spot in the outskirts of Brussels consisting of an old sports and wellness center where we took the habit to hang out after our runs. To get into the spot, you must go through a hole in a fence on a street, cross a small portion of woods, and you'll come up on an old football pitch and tennis courts. Up on a hill is the center, which is an old four-story building. The whole center takes up a whole street block, and on that day... We had just finished a five kilometer run and went to our spot as usual. We were walking to the building since it was about to rain when we saw two teenagers sitting on the roof edge. I remember thinking that it bothered me since we were planning to go to that roof as well. So we went to the hall area to wait for a bit in hopes that people would leave. In the hall area, you could have a clear view into the kitchen, which you must go through if you want to get to the roof. You could also see into another small hall and into the dining room. Sully was rolling himself a cigarette when I was gathering two chairs and an office table for us to sit. The next part gives me chills to this day. As I finished setting everything up, I remember starting to feel unwell, as if though I was being watched and not in a good way. And that's when I looked at the kitchen and saw for a brief moment a head sticking out of the door frame and staring right at us. It was a man. I couldn't say what age he was since he was all dirty, but the one thing that I remember is that he had an exaggerated happy expression on his face, like he had just found exactly what he was looking for. At that moment, I just froze and was unable to react bravely in that situation. I leaned slowly towards Soli, all while keeping eye contact with the man, and told him very calmly that we had to leave immediately. I tend to make lots of jokes to all of my friends, and especially to Soli, but when he saw the look that I had on my face when I told him that we had to leave, he didn't say a word, just took his backpack and stood up. We ran to the football pitch and saw that the two teenagers were still on the roof, so we started yelling at them, asking if the man was with them or if they had seen him, but they just answered that no, they hadn't seen anyone and had come by themselves so if someone was there, he wasn't with them. We told them that it was probably better for them to leave as well since we didn't know what the man in the lobby was up to. They told us that they would be fine and they would leave a little bit later. We decided to leave since we had already told them what we saw and we had also been out for a very long time so it wasn't very legal with the sort of confinement rules going on. As we were walking towards the woods, I turned back and I could swear that I saw a silhouette standing in front of the staircase leading to the roof, but my mind didn't quite react, and I had just left alongside with my friend. I was so shocked, because nothing like it had ever happened to me before, that I decided not to talk about it to anyone in fear of them not believing me or possibly even making fun of me. My friend Soli is the only one who was there. He didn't take a look at the man, but he is as scared as me just by seeing my own reaction at the time. I don't know what happened to these teenagers. I found local articles and papers dating from that time about teenagers being chased by a crazy man in an abandoned building, but the information given wasn't enough for me to be sure that it was the same people and the same story. This story happened a while ago, but it still haunts my mind. 
I live in a quiet countryside where usually nothing happens. I'm an 18 year old girl who can easily walk around my hometown alone without feeling scared because it's very safe here. Basically, there's almost no crime. So, as usual, my dog and I went for a walk one evening. The weather was nice so I decided to go to a nearby field. I usually let my dog off her leash there and it's fun for both of us. She's a nice dog and always comes when I call her. We reached the field and everything was going well and nothing seemed off. Except for this odd feeling in my gut that I don't usually have. The last time I had this feeling was when I was 8 years old and we were driving at night with my family. I said something like, I feel like something's wrong and you should be careful. They slowed down because I was oddly serious at that moment. A minute after I said that, a deer came out of nowhere and we would have crashed if we had been going at the same speed as a minute before. We were all shocked and my mom thanked me and I still remember it like it was yesterday. However, in the field ten years later, I got that same gut feeling. Whatever, I thought, and just kept going, completely ignoring it. We rolled around the fields and the nearby forest until the sunset started to go. I put my dog back on her leash and decided to leave from one of the tiny paths that go through a small forest. It's the quickest way to home. It's not a popular route, but it's quick. As I was walking along the path, I suddenly spotted a silhouette at the end of the road just before the forest started. I didn't think much of it at that point and kept walking. But after a while, I had a strong gut feeling, and I stared at the silhouette for a while. It was then that I noticed that the silhouette was staring back at me, without moving. I initially thought that maybe they were waiting for someone, as the silhouette looked like a child's. But as I got closer, I realized that it wasn't a child, but a grown man who was struggling to ride a child's bicycle. It was a blue-green boy's bicycle, and his legs were way too long for it. His whole body looked like he was forcing himself to ride it, and it was really an unsettling sight. Still, I didn't want to turn around and waste a couple of kilometers of time, even though it was creepy looking, I thought, maybe he's waiting for someone coming from my direction. But with every step I took, he followed me with an intense expression. I was only about 20 meters away from him when he started doing weird jumps on his bike, smiling the ugliest and most unsettling smile I'd have ever seen, just staring at me with wide eyes. He looked like he was expecting something and was so excited about it that he needed to jump. He appeared to be in his 50s or something, with very long and thin legs and arms, bald and that creepy unsettling smile. And that's when my alarm bells went off. I glanced behind me and there was no one there, just me, an 18 year old girl with her fluffy, definitely not a guard dog. I turned around 180 degrees and started jogging back the way I came, just in case. I glanced at him and sighed in relief when I noticed that he wasn't following me or anything. I thought maybe he wasn't waiting for me after all and called myself stupid and a scaredy cat, but I was wrong. My adrenaline started to slow down as I was in the middle of the fields and I still saw no sign of him following me. I let my dog off of her leash again and she started to run around. I was nearly at the end of the field, I only had a kilometer or so of forest before I got to my home after the field part, when my dog spotted a rabbit or deer or something interesting and bolted towards it. I panicked because she had never done that before and I yelled for her. I yelled plenty of times for her pretty loudly and finally she came back. I was relieved that nothing happened to her but as I put her back on her leash, I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. The bald man with the long legs was biking toward me. He wasn't looking at the ground when he biked, but at me. Freak out wasn't enough to express my feelings at that moment. I had never seen a human who looked so crazy, more than crazy. What surprised me the most was that he was biking through a field, and I can tell you, it's not an easy field to navigate sometimes. It has muddy ponds that you need to jump over, but that psycho just biked right through them. He was struggling a lot to bike there but somehow managed to do it and I didn't watch for another second behind me because I just started running. I ran so fast and I have asthma that I saw black and nearly collapsed. My lungs hurt so bad that I thought I was going to die but the adrenaline kept my blood running and my legs too. Once I glanced behind me and he was there 
struggling badly to keep up his full speed on the field grounds with that ugly white smile and the way too little bike. After that, I just ran like crazy until I found a house, hid in their yard without even minding that I was in someone else's yard. It didn't matter to me at that moment. I waited a while with my breathing stuck in my throat, but he didn't come. I had been planning to yell as loudly as I could if he found me, but he never did. At some point, the adrenaline started leaving my system and I left my hiding spot. I ran again until I reached an area with multiple people in their yards so I would have help if I saw him again, but I didn't. I typed 911 into my phone but couldn't bring myself to call, mostly because I had no proof and I didn't want my parents to find out since they were overprotective. I still live with them by the way. I've been paranoid since this incident and my dog was frightened too. I guess she noticed something was really off. I swear to God that I will always, always listen to my gut when it's telling me something from now on. I'm still scared of him and I've expected to randomly spot him in some area and wonder what he could have done to me. I can't forget his awful smile. I feel like he's going to reappear at my window one night and do whatever he wants to me. I feel paranoid and helpless and I'm still thinking about calling the police. I've never forgotten that event, even though it happened over 10 years ago now. Today, I'm 26 years old, and I still get goosebumps, and it's even creepier with my now adult eyes. In fact, to be more precise, this event took place over a period of more than 6 months. To put into context, it all started when I was about 14 years old. At the time, I was attending a private secondary school in the south of France, and I used to go to my grandmother's house every evening to wait for my mother to finish work and pick me up. My mother, who was retired, would wait for me in her car when I got out of school. However, as time passed, I wanted to be more independent. So, I asked her if I could take the bus home, and she agreed. I liked to put on my headphones and take advantage of the long journey to listen to my favorite music and be in my own world. The nearest bus stop to her house was about a 10 minute walk away. Unfortunately, the one opposite the dead end street where she lived had been condemned due to lack of use, but that didn't bother me as I enjoyed walking. So I started taking the same bus every day at roughly the same time, though my schedule could vary. For instance, I didn't have classes on Wednesday afternoons. When I was 14, I was quite childlike. By childlike, I mean that I had always had a youthful appearance. I didn't have a woman's figure and always had cute stuffed animals hanging from my bag. Well, I suppose you can imagine. One day, I first noticed this man on the bus at around September to October. He must have been in his 40s, not very tall and bald. Why did I notice him, you might ask? Because he was staring directly at me, and I had the feeling that he wasn't blinking. He would smile at me, but his smiles didn't inspire confidence. It was completely instinctive. I had never encountered the harsh realities of the world, I was still very naive, but I knew something wasn't right. I didn't say anything, I simply decided to avoid the situation that made me uncomfortable by looking in another direction. However, this was just the beginning of something I would remember forever. This man took the same bus as me every day at the same time, even when my schedule changed. To this day I still have no idea how he could have obtained this information. Was he watching me? Did he live near the school? He would always stare at me with those strange smiles, never speaking to me. I would get off the bus at my stop and he would stay on, and then the cycle would start all over again the next day. I was so terrified by the situation that I didn't dare tell anyone. I was afraid that they wouldn't believe me and I was also afraid that I wouldn't be allowed to leave the house afterwards. Then one day, around May to June at the end of the school year, I had had enough. I got off at a stop halfway through the journey and hid naively behind a tree to try to lose him. I was fed up with his persistent stares. However, the man also got off the bus and started looking for me. There was nobody else around and that's when I realized that I wasn't safe. The man was calling out to me saying, Where are you, sweetheart? Come out. Let's have a chat. I was, so to speak, sweating and unable to move from behind my tree. Of course he eventually found me. 
You're really pretty, you know that. I'd love to have a chat. Get to know you. Frankly, I didn't want to get to know him at all. He terrified me and I just wanted to go home. I tried to make him understand that he was frightening me and that I wanted him to leave me alone. I asked him what he wanted and he kept repeating the same thing. Just to get to know each other. The next bus arrived and I took the opportunity to run onto it, but he followed me. He sat down, stopped talking and continued to stare at me, smiling. I was in a state of internal panic. My thoughts were racing in all directions and I didn't know what to do. I made the worst decision of all, getting off at my usual stop and going back to my grandmother's house thinking that he would do the same and stay on the bus. However, this time, he got off at the same time as me. The stop was in a very lightly trafficked area and was lined with little dirt paths that served as shortcuts to parallel thoroughfares. I told myself that he was going to kidnap me, that he was going to take me down one of those paths and that I would never be able to go home again. But I didn't want him to notice my fear because it seemed to fuel him, give him a sense of dominance. So he continued to ask me to get to know each other while following me. I picked up the pace and he kept aligning himself with me and he wouldn't let go. Eventually I reached my grandmother's dead end street and finally saw the light at the end of the tunnel. I ran up to her house and she was standing in the doorway reading a book. She saw me coming, red faced and still shaking with panic, with the bald man staring at us from behind the gate. She saw my face and I didn't need to say anything. She yelled that she was going to call the police if he didn't leave immediately. He turned around and left that dead end street. After that, my grandmother categorically refused to let me take the bus again. Until my senior year, she wanted me up in front of the school gate every day. I never saw that man again. When I think that this guy, this adult, followed a 14 year old girl home, that he became fixated on me and that this happened every day. Who knows how far it could have gone. Maybe that's what's most worrying about all of this. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm. And there are super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night. I'd love to see you there. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories and big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, every time is the exact same length and girth. <laughs>